Hello and welcome to our webinar, How Digital Multinationals Innovate Across Borders. I'm Elizabeth Heichler, Editorial Director at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. So, the confluence of digitalization and globalization has created new opportunities for international expansion, yet rising geopolitical tensions and nationalism create new types of friction. In some markets, companies may be confronted by strong local forces that can limit the security and portability of digital assets and raise uncertainty and risk. Satish Nabisan and Yadan Lo are with us today to help us understand this new landscape, which they examine in depth in their new book, The Digital Multinational, Navigating the New Normal in Global Business. Satish is the Nancy and Joseph Keithley Professor of Technology Management at the Weatherhead School of Management, Case Western Reserve University. Yadong is the Emory M. Finley Distinguished Chair and Professor of Management at the University of Miami Herbert Business School. Welcome, Satish and Yadong. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, it's um, nice to be here. Um, we are, Yadong and I are very excited to be uh, you know, talk about our work, uh, both as part of the uh, book and the forthcoming article. I think uh, it's uh, one way to get off is to start off the talking about a little bit about the context, uh, globalization. Um, and as we have, uh, you know, mentioned in the in our book, the friend part of the book, uh, that uh, globalization has, uh, you know, almost a thousand year history. So there's been a whole lot of uh, things, innovations that have changed the pace of and the form of globalization. But if you look at the last uh, probably 20 years or so, uh, what we find is that it has a significant change in the uh, pace of in, uh, innovation and the, the rate of globalization. And uh, obviously, you know, one of the metrics uh, is of globalization is the number of multinational enterprises. So it has been the number of multinational enterprises has been increasing steadily uh, from around 1960s where it was about uh, 7,000 to until 2000, but it was around 38,000. But in this last 15 years or so, it has almost tripled, which shows us you know, the, the extensive uh, uh, rise in uh, the globalization itself. Obviously the key answer here is uh, digital technology or digitization. And that has uh, brought about uh, changes in the, the nature of uh, the, the entry of more of companies into different parts of the world, how they connect with customers, how they manage their subsidiary operations. So all of this has uh, really transformed uh, the globalization, which is why we call it as digital globalization. Now, if you, some of these companies are very, very clear because they are digital natives, right? Uh, Airbnb, Netflix, uh, Ola, Oyo, all these are companies that are born globals um, and uh, they are digital in nature. And it's very interesting to compare them with some of the traditional uh, multinationals. So if you take the uh, hotel industry, you know, Airbnb was um, set up in somewhere in 2008 or so, and it took them just uh, probably around uh, eight to nine years to get on to around 190 countries, to expand into 190 countries. If you look at uh, Marriott, which is a you know, brick and mortar uh, hotel chain, uh, which was uh, established in uh, about 1957 or 58, it took them around 70 years to get on to uh, expand into about 130 countries. So you see this disparity in the rate of uh, expansion of these companies, primarily due to the uh, you know, the portability and the scalability of digital business models, uh, which has brought about. So that is not just uh, restricted to these digital uh, natives, but also to the companies such as Unilever, uh, Johnson Controls, uh, Aditya Birla Group, and Philips. Uh, these are all companies that are, you know, traditional established large multinational companies, but have uh, transformed uh, their or processes or are in the process of transforming uh, how they operate digitally. And so, the, the uh, title of our book, Digital Multinationals, we refer to these companies and not necessarily to the Airbnb and Ubers of the world. And I think that is a very interesting uh, you know, storyline here. And if you just uh, get into innovation itself, we find that a uh, uh, lot of these innovation assets can be digitized, uh, processes are in, in digitally infused, and offerings are, uh, there's a whole lot of offerings where digital technology plays a key role. 
And uh, you can see that in companies such as Tom Hilfiger and uh, Bayer, um, how to what extent they change. For example, uh, in the fashion industry, they are started using uh, digital platforms that allow them to move digital design assets from one country to another, reuse them, recombine them, mix and match. That has not been the case uh, for a long time. So it allows them to react to local markets in a significantly faster way. And uh, the Climate uh, Field View is the uh, digital farming platform of Bayer, of Climate Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Bayer. That has uh, changed uh, the, how the company offers different types of services to farmers and uh, also um, enable the company to move to uh, not just to Europe, uh, but also to South America. So we find that uh, technology is uh, radically transforming um, multinationals' uh, responses to different uh, pressures and how they, uh, you know, how they expand. So that the whole uh, story till now has been that digital technologies enhance uh, globalization. On the flip side, we find uh, you know all of us are very familiar with many of these uh, uh, examples of what we call as deglobalization or localization. A lot of geo geopolitical tensions, you know, Brexit uh, in India, in China, in the U.S. Uh, all these places, we find that there is a lot of protectionistic measures coming along, and uh, there is uh, questions about um, whether foreign companies should be limited and how, in what way, they can be. Uh, uh, local companies can be uh, provide, promoted. So we find this um, story about global, digital globalization being confronted with this reality in some countries, at least in different parts of the world, uh, that there is new friction being created to digital globalization. That's, uh, that is something which uh, is very interesting and uh, that actually affects innovation too. It uh, relates to how um, innovation assets can be uh, moved from one country to another country, uh, the intellectual property rights, whether the regimes or IP regime is the same, and how uh, you know things like uh, techno nationalism might defeat the ability of uh, digital technology to uh, enhance uh, the innovation process itself. So in many countries, uh, you know it's, there has been discussion of split internet because there are infrastructures that are being increasingly protected and uh, isolated from the global internet. And uh, these are important um, trends that I believe uh, that we believe uh, can create uh, issues for companies as they try to expand into new markets. So really, uh, what we are trying to uh, the context is between these two. Um, and maybe Yadong, uh, would you like to come in and talk? Uh, add anything at this point? Oh, oh thank you, Fetish. Um, first. Uh, we thank all for, for participating and also for uh, Sloan man Management Review uh, for organizing this event. Um, obviously, there are a myriad of uh, uh, forces uh, behind deglobalization, but as far as deglobalization forces in the innovation context, I think there are a few uh, additional uh, factors uh, attributable to deglobalization. A, uh, as you alluded to, uh, intellectual property rights protection and uh, certain international organizations like WTO has been uh, very limited uh, in, uh, uh, in guiding and safeguarding uh, intellectual property rights for multinational businesses. And B is the uh, uh, shortage or shortfall in uh, digitization related global standards and global norms and practices. And I think the, uh, this lacking of uh, uh, global standards and certainly also deterred uh, uh, the otherwise uh, more, I think, the streamlined globalization for uh, digital uh, resources. Satish? Yeah. Um, you know, so in our book, we, you know, just, uh, we provide a simple scale for companies to evaluate the extent to which they are finding this uh, tension between uh, glo digital globalization and deglobalization in different markets. So this is a very simple 12 question framework, uh, you know, which uh, connects with policies, which uh, Yadong mentioned related to IP data flows. It relates to infrastructure, whether the norms of the and access to local regional infrastructures are, uh, you know, whether it promotes globalization or promotes localization, 
And also importantly, the culture, um, consumer culture, whether it is global or local, um, the culture of the employees related to innovation, and all these things combine to create, uh, you know, the, the where the tensions are and to what extent companies may uh, face it. So maybe at this point in time, it will be interesting to find out, um, you know, what uh, the uh, kind of tensions that your companies have. So we have a question um, that is set up here, a poll. Um, you know, to what extent does your company experience the tension between digital globalization and deglobalization forces? In foreign markets, so if you could just uh, go and uh, you know rate it on a one to five scale, where one is very low uh, tension and five is uh, that you are facing extreme tension, uh, I think this this would be uh, an interesting uh, you know finding for us. Um, so you know Yadong, I was mentioning this. Uh, you know, it depends on the industry and the market to what extent a company might face it in some markets it might be more in some markets less uh, both geographically and sector wise so it'll be interesting as to you know depending on the uh, kind of industry and um, geographical areas the companies are rooted in uh, we might uh, find different answers so i, I can see the you know it's uh, somewhere in the middle we see that the three and four it's uh, mo mostly uh, at the extremes, it's probably not very high, but uh, it's 27% uh, have got it as four and 27% as three. So this is, uh, you know, it tells us that uh, we have, uh, you know, some companies might face more and less in different, um, depending on what uh, geographical areas they uh, are related to. And that is really the context for our book too and the work that, you know, how do companies, uh, uh, connect with these uh, these different scenarios and how do they manage that uh, uh, the tensions and how do they uh, go from uh, you know globalized to deglobalized or localized environment so we asked uh, in this uh, uh, question um, you know the key question what we are trying to address here is how can digital business strategies help companies realize this promise uh, you know, that is offered by digital globalization, portability, scalability, um, you know, all these things, yet adapt to the frictions caused by uh, the localization forces, geopolitical tensions, nationalism in uh, different markets. And that's really the uh, what we have been trying to address in this book and in this, uh, um, uh, uh, in this article. Now, I think uh, we can shift the gears a little bit. Our um, concept that we look at is loose coupling. And so we will first talk a little bit about loose coupling and then come back to how digital technologies enable loose coupling. So, you know, for those of you who are familiar or worked in the computing industry or have done some software programming, this would be very, uh, uh, you know, something which is, you know, quite well because we have been, uh, you know, as a software programmer, you are trained to uh, have loosely coupled uh, systems, right? Where, um, so loose coupling really relates to, uh, from a systems perspective, that different parts of the system uh, have uh, less interdependencies. And that allows for changes um, in one part not having impact on the other parts of the system. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a simplistic uh, definition or conceptualization. When it comes to organizational um, context, it's slightly more nuanced. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it and then Yadong will uh, explain it more. So you can think about as uh, you know, tightly coupled on the one end, uh, where uh, if you think about a multinational company with its subsidiaries in different countries, uh, its ecosystem partners and other parts, then you can think about um, you know all of that is high, tightly integrated, uh, very very limited uh, autonomy for the local units. On the other end, um, we have uh, highly decoupled, where uh, significant local autonomy. So there is very little integration across the internal units. Now most uh, companies don't have decoupled because it's not uh, for a multinational. It's not feasible to operate in a decoupled manner. So it's uh, either tightly coupled or loosely coupled. And uh, the distinction really comes down to the kind of uh, uh, connections or the rest, what we call as a responsiveness between the different parts, whether they operate together um, and the distinctiveness, which is how uh, individual subsidiaries are uh, reflect the distinctive aspects of the local market they are occupying. And so if you think about uh, tightly coupled, it is 
uh, very high responsiveness that uh, different parts of the enterprise uh, can connect with one another but very low distinctiveness where you know they, they are not uh, uh, there is a global uniform uh, standard and they're not really tailored to local markets on the other side if it's loosely coupled we are trying to get the uh, benefit of both uh, some responsiveness and some distinctiveness so uh, this this is uh, one way to think about how loosely coupled um, organizations might work um, you don't would you like to expand on that a little bit more sure um, coupling captures uh, the essence of digital connectivity or what we call economy of linkages for uh, business leaders, we, we very much all know uh, how to uh, uh, fulfill economies of scale, economies of scope, especially for cross-border operations. Uh, but digitization uh, affords another key uh, strategy uh, and a practice that is economy of linkage. And this economy of linkage uh, can be, again, achieved by uh, three C's, uh, connecting, collaborating, and uh, combining. So coupling, the term coupling actually captures uh, these three C's. But the reason why we also uh, need, the, uh, need the quality of loose or looseness, because the digital itself, uh, technologically, it has uh, three characteristics uh, at the list. That is the um, the openness, digital openness, digital digital affordance or, or affordances, and the digital generati generativity. So these three digital characteristics enable the companies to optimize, to differentiate, and to orchestrate with a variety of different eco eco partners, whether outside or within the firm, like subsidiaries. So I think the loose coupling is. Uh, not just the logic to explain this digital phenomenon, but actually it could also guide uh, the strategy formulation for uh, business leaders. Satish? Thank you. Um, you know, so the question here is, uh, so as Yadong was explaining, loose coupling as an idea, as a, you know, a theoretical or abstract idea is not new. Uh, what is really new is the capability to um, realize that uh, loose coupling in organizations. And so that is where the digital connectivity and digital technologies come in. That is where, you know, the new, uh, some of the new technologies that are coming to our use in the last 10 years or 15 years and the capabilities they afford uh, really uh, enable um, in, uh, implementing uh, digital cu uh, loose coupling. So it's really on the one side, uh, technologies can enhance portability and scalability, which we talked about. On the other hand, it can also in infuse a lot of flexibility and adaptiveness. And it is this mixing of these capabilities and related to the technology that allows tightness and looseness, depending on you know how globalized or how localized a global uh, market is, with um, different uh, parts of this uh, company. And uh, so, in our framework, we look at um, customers or uh, markets. So how does the company connected with uh, global customers and markets? Uh, operations, internal operations um, uh, in different parts of these uh, subsid foreign subsidiaries. Uh, resources, how the resources are acquired and used in different parts of the world. And ecosystem partners. So these are four broad um, components of connectivity or elements of connectivity. And we look at, uh, you know, we have a framework which uh, allows us to drill down further into each of these. So, for example, we'll talk a little bit more about innovation later on, but if you think about innovation, uh, there is connectivity with the source of innovation and there is also connectivity with the assets uh, that you have in different uh, parts of the world. And likewise, uh, if you look at customers, you have connectivity with markets and uh, the connectivity between brands and your customers, uh, global customers. So for each of these uh, elements, what we call as elements, we can, uh, you know, we can uh, enable different levels of coupling or tight, whether tightness or looseness. And so the business strategies that are enabled by digital technologies allow us to do this. And so this really captures what we are talking about in the book. Uh, 
much of the context is dictated by this uh, tension between globalization and localization. And based on that, uh, we have to de devise strategies that uh, you know, either infuse more tightness or more looseness into the uh, connectivity bit, uh, with all these different parts. And I think uh, what, what we call as a digital global business connectivity, that is really a capability. It's not just technology. It is technology married with some strategies and it is the underlying capability of the organization. And that is something which uh, is very important to, uh, we believe, are important for multinationals to um, develop or acquire uh, in the future. So here is a you know, second question for you. How well prepared or, or equipped is your company to achieve uh, digital global business connectivity? And again, uh, you, know, you can rate it on a one to five scale where one is very low capability and five is that your company has uh, extremely good capability in, in that uh, part of the uh, sphere. So by the way, we did this survey a couple of years back and uh, we're going to show you that results right after you know, we hear from you as an attendee as to you know, where uh, our attendees today are. Uh, but I think uh, this is something which is going to become more and more important. Um, and uh, we will see, um, you know, different companies might emphasize different areas. For example, it's for some companies, it might be more connectivity with customers, whereas others might be connectivity with other companies. So again, we have a mix, uh, you know, uh, nothing in the very low and very high, but it uh, seems like uh, uh, somewhere in the middle. Um, this is actually better than, uh, so if we have 30% of the attendees saying they are uh, at a rated four and 29% three. Um, when we did the survey um, now, um, two years back, or maybe one and a half years back, uh, this is what we got uh, in the survey. Uh, you know, we found that um, uh, as you can see, uh, roughly 80% of the people, uh, so the companies that we surveyed, uh, said that it is very important. Um, but um, only around 25% rated themselves as uh, equipped uh, or capable to uh, in, in that uh, digital global business connectivity. So it, this gap between you know the deemed importance and how much. Uh, uh, where they are at this point in time is really what uh, motivated us to uh, write this book too. So the objective was to provide some answers uh, towards uh, uh, that part of the uh, question. So in the you know in the remaining uh, few minutes, I think what we'll do is we'll take some um, examples from innovation um, and just uh, you know illustrate what this means, this loose coupling means. Um, uh, in practice. So as we mentioned earlier, um, you know, there are two broad uh, things that we can look at for uh, uh, tight and loose coupling in innovation. One is with the source of innovation, whether it is companies or individuals or customers, where you get ideas and what kind of innovation you uh, collaborate or partner with. And the other part is the assets, uh, the innovation assets that you develop and which you can reuse or mix and match uh, and so what is the nature of the connectivity? So uh, let's take the first one, which is the um, you know, innovation sources. So if it is a highly globalized environment, then it is, uh, you can form very strong uh, or tightly coupled um, uh, relationships, uh, connectivity with your innovation sources. And uh, uh, technology enables um, you know, creating virtual environments where there is enhanced uh, collaboration uh, and uh, sharing of uh, assets. Uh, one of the companies that we studied, not Philips, but another uh, US-based uh, uh, medical devices company. So this company was uh, you know, um, innovating on a device, medical device, and they had two partners in Europe and one partner in India. And they were, uh, this, so this product had some hardware and software and um, they were challenged with the, how to navigate this because uh, you know they had to streamline the software has to uh, be developed only after some part of the hardware can be developed so because they were in the type of environments the partners were one is uh, was in eu and the other was in india they decided to form a virtually a secure virtual environment for the innovation process and so they had uh, simulations going on um, sharing of assets uh, and that really enabled 
the company to move ahead uh, at a much faster pace. Um, there was a lot of trust in the infrastructure, in the uh, regulatory environment, and uh, which enabled uh, more tight coupling. The other um, situation is when it is not, uh, the localization forces are high for whatever reason, and uh, then uh, you don't want that kind of tight coupling. You want more loose coupling so that the units in the local units can respond or adapt uh, better. And so again, uh, Philips is a good example for that. So they have, uh, um, in China, in Shanghai, they have an R&D lab uh, where uh, they, um, there's a lot of um, innovation that goes on. But all of these innovations are with uh, some of these large technology, Chinese technology companies, and are re really restricted to um, the Chinese market for various reasons. Uh, some of it is infrastructural, the other is uh, the, some of the uh, limitations for moving data and other assets uh, beyond China. So that is, an, you know, that is a specific uh, context where the uh, environment um, limited the kind of uh, coupling that uh, they could actually practice. Um, and the uh, you know, loose coupling was, uh, was much more appropriate. If you look at uh, innovation assets, we find that uh, you know, uh, as you digitize innovation assets, whether it is product components, processes, uh, data, uh, design documents, uh, marketing um, documents or marketing literature, all of these are digitizable. So when they, once you digitize it, it can be shared across uh, national borders uh, of a company. It can be, you know, it can be combined, recombined in different ways or mixed and matched. And it provides uh, you know, a, a lot of novel possibilities or opportunities for innovation. But again, uh, the globalization, localization process can limit to what extent you can do all these things, uh, despite the technological capabilities. So here is one, if it is a highly globalized environment, then you can uh, have a very broad uh, portal, which is, uh, you know, which is a broad framework um, or a platform where you can share assets across uh, borders of the uh, national or geographical borders. Whereas if it is a uh, more localized environment, then you have to really limit um, the extent of sharing of those assets. So it's a more regional asset portals. And that's what, uh, you know, companies such as Johnson Controls and John Deere um, and even uh, Bayer have uh, implemented in the past few uh, years. Um, so they have, for example, if you take Johnson Controls Open Blue, which has been there for now two years or so, it is a broad global standard or framework which allows the company to uh, not just digitize, but also provide a modular uh, infrastructure for uh, its subsidiaries to innovate um, by reusing some of these different components. Whereas in, in China, again, um, the company has, uh, uh, you know, so Johnson controls a lot of uh, collaborations with Chinese technology companies. Much of it is to build uh, smart hospitals. Um, and uh, that has, uh, for various reasons, again, infrastructural um, localization, uh, regulatory localization, uh, the ability for the company to create assets that can be reused in different parts of the world has been more limited. So it is a much more uh, regional asset portal that the company has uh, created. Uh, Unilever um, in, has a very interesting AI hub that it started a couple of years back in Shanghai. Um, it uses this uh, live streaming, which has become very important in China, uh, the live streaming data to innovate. So it creates a lot of ideas out of the uh, data that comes out of this. But again, um, data restrictions, um, policies, uh, local policies, um, much of it restricts the extent to which um, the insights and the uh, ideas that are developed there can be uh, you know, taken to other parts of the world. So again, uh, the portal becomes much more restricted in a, a regional or um, local or country setting. Um, you know, any other thoughts on, before we wrap up? Sure, uh, briefly, uh, two points. Um, first is that the, uh, the reason why we introduce loose coupling uh, also has to do with the reason that the structural change 
organizational structure change to respond to uh, deglobalization and te techno nationalism, for example, tends to be much harder and, 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 and lasts longer. And, and structure change is always uh, 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 involving a lot of inertia within uh, big multinational companies. But digital connectivity or digi digital adaptation uh, should arise as the remedy which can actually uh, 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 offset some of the structure inertia uh, or structure problem. So I think the loose coupling uh, is very consistent with the, uh, the digital connectivity created uh, the, the, the quickness uh, in, to adapt to uh, deglobalization. De the second point is the uh, Satish mentioned uh, digital connectivity with both innovation resources and innovation assets. Um, I think the book, our book also uh, uh, touches uh, digital connectivity for uh, innovation processes uh, in a sense that the digital connectivity, again, not just as a technology, but uh, as the capabilities can actually facilitate the, uh, the knowledge flow within multinational company, knowledge deployment within multinational company, and even global R&D process uh, can be actually uh, augmented uh, largely by these digital capabilities. Sadish? Thank you, Edom. Uh, very, very uh, important points. So I think at this point, we'll just wrap up. Um, you know, our book is right now available, I believe, uh, just came out uh, two days back. So, uh, you know, if you're interested, um, uh, feel, feel free to go to the link uh, provided uh, on this slide. Um, I think uh, I will just uh, wrap up and give it to um, uh, Elizabeth. Hi, thank you so much, Satish and Yadong. Um, very brief overview of the many ideas that you have here. So I'm hoping we can, we've got some good questions from the audience and uh, hope we can, we can delve down uh, into a little more detail here with, with some of what you've been talking about. Um, I, I think, you know, the one thing, uh, you, know, you gave us a, a good overview of uh, uh, your know, tight and loose coupling, but can you go into more detail about how in practical terms uh, to make loose coupling work? Um, you don't you want to go first on that? Oh, sure. Uh, uh, I think for me, uh, I would put this answer uh, of what I call three uh, three A's or uh, triple A's, um, comprising first A, which is alignment. Uh, we are talking about multinational enterprises, so we have to to create alignment between global mandates and local mandates, a global integration requirements on the one hand and a local adaptation and a local requirements on the other hand. We have to also keep the alignment uh, between uh, what I call hard power, which is a digital technologies, but also soft power, which is a digital intelligence. Uh, I think the second A for me is what I call ambidexterity. Ambidexterity means that the, uh, the digital connectivity as a capabilities uh, really requires uh, the business leaders to, um, to uh, strike a right balance, for example, uh, between scalability and adaptability, and between the ecosystem partnerships outside the firm, but also internal control. So I think a digital connectivity alone is the loose coupling concept actually introduces us or compel us to think of more seemingly conflictual issues, but unite these issues in a ambidext ambidextrous ways. So for me, that's the second A. The last A for me is what I call uh, amalgamation or aggregation. So amalgamation means for digital assets, Satish and I, we notice uh, uh, through so many field studies, many big multinationals actually have a lot of adequate uh, digital assets. But the problem is they didn't do well in orchestrate, in configurate, in rebundling and recombining. So amalgamation or aggregation tell or indicates 
the need and necessity to uh, really uh, utilize, make a best use of current portfolio of assets. And that takes so much uh, for headquarters or an a chief digital officer, of course, and a team and their teams to really orchestrate. So I think loose coupling has one more, I think, a reminder that is a cross-border orchestration uh, for digital flows and digital assets. Got it. Great. Thank you. Um, now, uh, one of the uh, things you mentioned is that uh, you know, in deciding on your strategy, whether it's appropriate to take a you know, approach of loose or tight coupling in a given market, um, you know, that requires a a, a thorough evaluation of market conditions there. Um, to what extent do you see leaders being uh, uh, g gathering accurate information? How can they get past their sort of possibly dated or inaccurate assumptions or some of the conventional wisdom that, uh, you know, especially foreigners and, and overseas market might have? What are some good ways of, of getting an accurate picture of the situation on the ground? So that, that's a very interesting question. I think, uh, you know, technology allows us to gather intelligence um, a lot. But I think, like you said, this bias is something which, uh, uh, you know, comes in the way of interpreting. So, um, you know, the one um, uh, framework which we talked about, it also relates to your uh, previous question is, uh, you know, companies have um, regional hubs uh, where intelligence can be at, uh, much more uh, aggregated or integrated. Um, it can also be at the edge of the uh, of the organization. There are different edges, which uh, you know, which is the subsidiaries, and different types of information coming from the edge and the uh, hub. So the kind of information that you get at the hub is what uh, you know we call as collective intelligence, which is you know your enterprise data has a lot of insights, so you mine that and you get lots of interesting insights. But a totally different information comes from the edges of your company, uh, which is that. You know what are the things that are changing in terms of your market, your customers, and I think the capability to bring these two together and uh, position them in a way that uh, provides some additional insight. That I think is what is really important, and that's to some extent it relates to loose coupling because we are saying that it is not just the focus on the uh, hub, but also on the focus on the edge and how you can bring this insight from both because they are different types of insights. And how you can bring so that that might be uh, you know obviously that requires uh, as you mentioned uh, you know getting over the one's bias because typically the people sitting in the headquarters are biased towards the uh, insights that come from the hub uh, and they uh, you know they disregard this especially if they are faint signals that are coming from the edges of the network um, i think how do you how do you uh, you know position these two uh, and how do you, uh, you know, develop strategies that are based on both? I think that is something which is very interesting. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, now we have a, a question from the audience here of uh, raising a sort of interesting point about the, uh, you know, some nuances and deglobalizing forces. Uh, it, we, you, you discuss in the book, um, or we're used to the sort of, you know, buy, buy local kinds of forces. Um, but uh, Tom Donderwinkle here points out that, uh, you know, deglobalization may be affected now by a growing sense of uh, and sensitivity to interdependencies that we that, that has come about because of COVID-19 and supply yeah. chain issues and, uh, you know, suddenly real concerns about the, you know, like we see, you know, in, in the U.S., um, building uh, finally some investment in, in semiconductor <laughs> manufacturing infrastructure, which we haven't seen for a long time. So as a result of that, um, do you see that happening? And uh, you know, to, to what extent do you think this will be a lasting influence in sort of de deglobalization forces? So this is very interesting. I'll let uh, Yadong uh, talk after this. But, uh, you know, when we started writing this book, we started just before the COVID came. And at that time, we were looking at deglobalization global. And COVID came in March of 2020. That's when we really started writing the book. And we found that, you know, it has impacted both globe, digital globalization and deglobalization. And what you just mentioned is the deglobalization part. Uh, you know, uh, strategic autonomy for many countries have said that that is a big thing for them. So Japan, for example, have invested during the COVID years. They made a significant investment in in that. And uh, the, your our semiconductor chip here in the U.S. is another uh, key aspect of that. So I think uh, 
that in supply chain issues. So I think there is a real concern about uh, dependencies and that is going to last longer, uh, probably at least in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, that makes it more important that uh, it is not a passing phase. If you look back in history, you know, we have had deglobalization waves at different points in time, right? World War II, and, but then after some time it goes down and then globalization takes over. I think this time, uh, some of these localization forces are going to remain um, for a longer time. And I think that makes, uh, you know, strategies that are based on loose coupling much more uh, uh, relevant, um, uh, at least from my perspective. Sure, I think the, um, this is a great question. Um, uh, I think this certain, um, the deglobalization uh, phenomenon, such as in semiconductor, might be uh, less enduring, um, but the overall globalization has entered a new phase of what we may call interfered globalization or global cooperation, meaning uh, the simultaneous competing and the collaboration in the same chessboard. Again, cooperation. I think the reason why um, the, this interfered globalization will sustain longer uh, because the philosophy or doctrine behind those policy makers in some of the, the strongest political power, geopolitical power nations are what we call uh, political realism. So political realism is now the, the, the reality, the doctrine behind policy make makers in a variety of countries. Now that doctrine argues that that the, the job of uh, nations should seek the geopolitical power dominance vis-a-vis -vis other nations. So technological technological uh, advancement, digitization and R&D will become the means for the country to seek geopolitical power. So national security will be used as the umbrella to cover so many uh, their operational policies. So as long as political realism, uh, uh, the, the regime is still remaining and pervasive, I suspect this deglobalization as a logic will remain probably longer than we thought. Right. Thank you. Yeah, and we had a related question from uh, another audience member asking whether uh, you uh, you cover or have a point of view on the issue of uh, you know foreign direct investment rules and protectionism as they relate to digital commerce um, in some countries and how that uh, you know these are as requirements such as you know restrictions on marketplace location of inventory um, and so on related for you know direct consumer online commerce um, that's is that something that that you cover have thoughts on how uh, organizations can think about that or work that into their strategies? yeah I, I can mention briefly and then Satish uh, can can add on um, the book uh, didn't detail FDI, foreign direct investment uh, policy setting uh, for uh, for digital strategies, but we did uh, have a chapter about the uh, digitization infrastructure. For that, uh, it comprises both hard infrastructure, uh, such as the uh, the digital uh, the uh, the five five G uh, infrastructure, but also we talk about the soft infrastructure for digitization and for that it means FDI policies and the market entry localization and data and content requirements um, so to to the prospect I think this will be issue I do not see the solution uh, in a very uh, near term uh, the reason was a um, we do not have a great effective bilateral global governance system to allow uh, both governments and, and uh, companies to sit down and find common ground and solutions. Now we are still, do, we do still, we are, we are uh, ineffective for that system. Secondly, um, when one country or one powerhouse initiate uh, the restrictions of FDI for digital uh, products, 
most likely the counterpart will launch similar counteractive policies against the other countries uh, companies that creates certainly uh, the, the vicious circle and affect multinational companies uh, so remarkably. So I think the uh, these two are I think the uh, the policy directions to go, but within the current geopolitics, uh, at least for me, I'm not sure for that. Okay, thank you. Um, and let's see another question. You had uh, you referred uh, in. Uh, in the presentation to um, sort of a lack of global standards. Uh, can you be a little more specific about um, what, what standards areas in, in particular uh, are lacking? Right, so the standards can be on different, uh, you know, different dimensions. It can be technology standards. Uh, you'll be surprised that, uh, you know, we, be, we think that uh, across now that internet and everything is there, there is a, a lot of you know sort of accepted uh, standards but uh, there are countries which uh, adhere to different uh, just the technology standards and so so it affects the connectivity but i think also the standards related to practices which is very important innovation practices uh, you know not just ip and other uh, uh, policies but also um, you know how companies interact and how what what are the partnership uh, practices or policies so the, the, i think uh, there's a whole lot of uh, standardization that is missing in that sphere too or rather it is uh, affected by uh, some of these uh, geopolitical tensions and localization forces so i think uh, standardization global standards we relate to different uh, spheres of uh, companies activity in fact we have a chapter on um, uh, globalization uh, risk uh, digital globalization risk where we talk a little bit more about uh, you know what happens if uh, you know you expand to a country where the access to the infrastructure is not uh, the same as what you have in your home country uh, right in many different countries the access to we, we think that the access to uh, innovation infrastructure technological infrastructure all are open but that's not true so even there the standards are different in terms of practices yeah right to build on uh, Sergei's points uh, I think in a general uh, level, uh, there are three uh, uh, arch archetypes for uh, this uh, standardization uh, bilaterally and, uh, and multilaterally. One is the digital risk itself, as Seth has just pointed out. I think that's the very first and foremost areas of a setting for the standards across borders. Uh, the security, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the stability, security, and those are um, the, the the first. I think the uh, the minimum standards. The second uh, uh, category of standard setting, I think, would be uh, the well-being, welfare of our stakeholders, uh, consumers, consumers' rights, rights. How to uh, encourage and foster competition, both opening to local firms and foreign firms. And so that's the welfare, well-being of uh, consumers in particular. And the third level uh, or higher uh, uh, level of uh, standard setting for me is the social development. Um, how even multinational companies can help to address uh, inequalities, um, the, uh, the poverty issues, I think through a standard setting. So United Nations have those uh, campaign and OECD and the European Union uh, more broadly started actually uh, 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 already uh, by building a few groups and, 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 and task forces and specializing in uh, creating such uh, preliminary standards. And I suspect that the, uh, the European Union might uh, be able to uh, take the leadership uh, in this regard. Okay, thank you. And let's see, but we've got some questions on sort of leadership and organizational kinds of issues. Um, first on, uh, one on just uh, kind of organizational structure. Do, um, you know, separately from digital uh, business strategies, we also see, you know, companies have made decisions that uh, probably run deep and, and have a lot of history around whether they're you know philosophically you know centralized or decentralized in terms of how they they operate with their global subsidiaries um, you know different companies may be giving more leeway to uh, local subsidiaries based more on management philosophy and um, 
the particular circumstances that you're talking about. Do you see uh, sort of a, are companies that have that more tightly coupled approach also tend to be more centralized in their global management or have you seen any examples where it's possible to retain a somewhat decentralized management philosophy where um, there's more accountability and responsibility devolved out to the local unit and yet also have a tightly coupled? I can approach this uh, first and briefly and I said, uh, can you reach that? Um, uh, two points. First, uh, to answer this great question, uh, we generally uh, offer three types of global strategies for a variety of different multinationals. The global strategy, which is very uh, uh, centralized, globally integrated uh, organizational system. Uh, this is the global strategy. Second is what we call multi-domestic, which is extremely decentralized and autonomous and let the local managers make most of the decisions. And what is uh, the, the third strategy in between is what we call hybrid or transnational solution, and which is the most companies are falling within. So for transnational solution based companies, I suspect that the, um, the digital connectivity as a capability or competence uh, will really help companies to uh, make more informative decisions to help streamline hierarchical structures. So, so in that regard, a great, greatly equipped uh, digital competence can actually help companies to move a bit more toward decentralized global system, meaning the frontier managers will be more able to voice, share your, their inputs, and, and I think they even contribute knowledge from foreign to headquarters or reverse knowledge flow. So I think the uh, third point, if I may, is this organizational aspect of uh, integrating and a digital aspect of connectivity, connectivity have to work together. And so, so I think the, the, that's why when we look at or redefine connectivity, we're trying to highlight so many ways that this connectivity has to be interpreted as the competence, including digital mind, mindfulness, including digital, uh, digital nimbleness, uh, in, rather than just purely technological sphere. So this way. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. And you know, just, just to build on uh, Yadong's uh, um, uh, answer, uh, an example of that company that I can think about is Unilever. You know, Unilever is a very vast, it has, I think, I believe, 190 countries uh, presence. And it has been, you know, if you look at the history of Unilever, it has moved from uh, highly centralized to more uh, regional and then going back. And so it has moved a little bit uh, uh, on the continuum. But, uh, you know, just to take one um, example, they have a system which I think they started um, operating maybe two years or three years. It's called uh, flex uh, system, which uh, basically for talent management. Um, so it allows employees in different parts of Unilever to uh, bid on or to work on projects um, through the, it's more like internal uh, a system for uh, distributing talent. So it, it brings, uh, you know, just what uh, Yedong mentioned that technological capabilities now allow companies to have both a uh, global perspective um, and at the same time, allow individual units, local units to, uh, you know, to seek talent, uh, to get talent from for unique projects and to uh, deploy that in a much more decentralized manner. So I think uh, technological, digital technological capabilities, along with the right uh, structure and strategy um, would, uh, you know, bring about uh, a much more focused uh, implementation of that. Now, let's see, we've got about five minutes left and a very good meaty question that I hope we can do justice to. Uh, and that is about leadership skills. What are the uh, what, are, what are these leadership skills that stand out for you both in, um, you know, make it both both de developing and executing um, a sort of digital multinational global multinational strategy? Uh, let me just, uh, and then Yedong can uh, add to it, but I think there are, you know, one thing which we found in our research is that, uh, 
good uh, leaders in these digital organizations of multinational companies are people who I recognize and acknowledge that they cannot control everything and that they are they have uh, you know they have to really orchestrate uh, because their subsidiaries and their ecosystem partners in different parts of the world um, are loosely coupled and if you want to manage such a system you have to you know you have to act through your influence rather than your uh, structural control and once you recognize that then your how you communicate what you communicate to your partners uh, it is uh, provides a much more inclusive vision of uh, how value is created and i think uh, that that is something which is very very important uh, from the leadership perspective the other part is uh, is that technology is always uh, you know have two uh, two sides on one side technology can enhance the efficiency and the other side it can in infuse more flexibility and you you know the what we call is the duality of digital and uh, you know if you can keep both these in your mind as you look at opportunities in uh, different parts of your uh, business i think then it uh, leads to a much more uh, uh, sensible and useful and effective um, uh, developing a business strategy so i think uh, those are some capabilities that came from our uh, you know from our field work I uh, if i may yeah i think um, i i think the, the 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 effective business leaders in the digital era uh, must a i think be more uh culturally and organizationally ambidextrous uh, uh balancing between for example digital transformation uh, we, we we called for uh, or we all called for but also stability so evolutional evolutionability but also uh, stability i think the second point i think it's um, the digital uh, the leadership has to be more intelligent and that intelligence has to be more holistic treating uh, not only risk intelligence uh, in a digital era, era but also geopolitical intelligence culture intelligence ideological intelligence and and of course market intelligence into foreign consumers so that holistic sense of intelligence is on the one hand become more available because of digital connectivity but also become more complex on the other hand uh, so i think beside uh, digital mindfulness this this holistic digital uh, holistic intelligence uh, sense as well as the uh, the culture or managerial ambidexterity balancing similar conflictual issues i think is what the great leader should be great thank you and perfect timing that's that is all we have time for so thank you both very very much for your time today and a terrific presentation really appreciate you sharing your insights and i'd also like to thank out systems who are our sponsors for today's event um, and thank you to the audience. Uh, we're grateful that you came and uh, spent some of your time with us today, and we hope that you found the uh, content to be valuable. And with that, uh, thank you all so much, and we hope that you'll join us again for another event in the future. Thank you. Thank you.